Sukuna has to be one of the biggest crash out characters in recent times. I mean, the moment he was able to stay in control for more than 10 minutes, he leveled the whole fucking city. And even with that, he still held back to make sure not to hurt Megumi. I mean, yeah, you got Mahito doing this, this, and this. Yes, I showed those on purpose, but in my opinion, it doesn't really compare to Sukuna. But for the sake of the video, let's look past his actions. Let's look past his demented nature. Let's look past his... His fine abs, his refined muscle lacerations. A mouth the size of a waistline. Four big hands. Sorry, 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 look. Let's look past all of that, and you get someone more deep and complex than many people realize. A character more than the atrocities he's committed. And I think people don't realize this because of this interaction right here. One of the last times we see him in the series. And I'm sure most people were expecting some sort of backstory. Some extra chapters to go into why he was the way he was before his defeat. But instead, we get a calm and somewhat civil interaction. Seemingly being content with where he is now with no regrets. Claiming that in another life, perhaps could have taken another path. And again, people wanted more. But, in my opinion, did we really need more? I mean, all the foreshadowing and context wasn't spoon-fed to us in the form of a backstory, but instead sprinkled throughout the series, giving the audience a more natural and somewhat unique take on providing character context. People watch shows while doing other stuff in life. Entertainment can be therapeutic or conventionally enjoyable, but the time taken to enjoy something is still time budgeted from the rest of life and sometimes different problems you're working on in your head carry on while engaging with something. And entertainment you consume can also influence how those problems are approached or solved. We can't watch too much because there's other stuff to do. And we can't watch meaninglessly because the time spent watching stuff and engaging with compelling stories has impact over our thoughts. Some stories then try to cram additional real-life education or arguments to make messages into the underlying aspects of their content to make them more meaningful. It helps stories get greenlit, it gives them a better public reception, and it also means that sometimes major plot points or resolutions depend on picking up and engaging with these messages and takeaways. If you've ever had a conversation with ChatGPT, it should be clear that it doesn't really understand language. It just applies definitions on the surface but it doesn't remember previous conversations, and it doesn't actually get the words. Sometimes it'll claim something that's the exact opposite of what it said moments ago, because all it's doing is pulling from a database like a parrot without actually reflecting on what it's citing. And what's disheartening is that there are so many people out there who will look at a message of a story, say they understand the message of it, then hijack and impact the conversation and exposure to say how deep or moving it is, and then every time the message of the story is actually relevant to their life, they'll act like they never heard it and never actually register how it applies to them. People who do that are like ChatGPT as human beings. And I'd be frustrated too if anyone acknowledged what would be pretty universally considered some kind of important or necessary message, but then only actually use it in their life to validate them doing the opposite, and then not bothering to realize how it contradicts. So we have a story that takes into account that previous stories exist, that most of its audience claim to know or have access to already, and that are way too dependent on explicit messages like Naruto or Fate for example. And then this story takes those abundant, overlapping messages and what they say all in common, and instead of telling it to you for the hundredth time, it disguises the actual sides and justifications in the setting unless you look at it with those messages in mind. So it silently expects you to apply what you have had more than enough chances to learn, and the storyline punishes you if you never do. This is Jujutsu Kaisen. In Fate Stay Night, the main character's future self is summoned from the future and plays a part in repeating a cycle of disasters, because he needs to learn that if everyone matters enough to help in life, then that includes him too, and otherwise he's just motivating himself to do what looks like helping people out of his own personal guilt and compulsions, at the cost of only gaining responsibility over time and then weighing the rest of the world down with his inability to deliver as his actions make it so they increasingly depend on him. In Neon Genesis Evangelion, the main character has to learn that actions and consequences depend on other stuff that goes on in the external shared world, and that he can't just see things from his own perspective if he wants to meaningfully solve any ongoing problems. 
and in Naruto, the main character has to learn that anyone standing out as a villain or causing problems is even more of a victim of whatever circumstances cause them to act differently than how someone would normally know they objectively should, and that vilifying them is closer to making them sacrifices for the rest of the population to thrive, more than it would be justice. That overall problem solving comes from hostilic productivity, rather than needlessly and regressively demanding fights or making sides, at the cost of everything continuing to be worse off. Sure, you could say that it's tiring how many promoted manga and anime stories focus on the same couple family of messages. Especially when you can guess a lot of what values that industry was initially founded to ultimately contribute to, based on the earlier drafts of its current formulas. Take for instance Spaceship Yamato, that advertises an eco-friendly message to decorate a story where the bad guys drop radioactive bombs on the good army. The bad army is a unified hive mind paralleled by how the heroic human army is led by people who insist on doing things their own way. The remnants of humanity in the apocalypse have come to believe the Japanese army in World War II had always had humanity's best interests in mind. So they collectively put their faith in the recreation of one of their military vessels that was specifically made so they can take pride in continuing and inheriting that military's legacy and spirit. And the main character saves the day by kamikazing himself in space with lasers and robots. Which I mean was made in the 70s and only 30 years after the war. Which there would obviously be lingering influence from that government. So this continuation of values could only be expected from big entertainment pieces, promoted to be big economic and influential successes for the nation, especially apparent in something meant to be a major animation like Spaceship Yamato. Not to mention, the current manga and anime industries were products of the entertainment revolution following World War II that was clearly carried out by the exact same government from that time, since it just happened. And yeah, Jujutsu Kaisen does the same thing. But who knows how much of Jujutsu Kaisen or Spaceship Yamato could be from parties holding reins over the nationwide publishing and distribution, or necessary compromises for the story to be greenlit, so their creators can at least also get out the actual meaningful messages they wanted to say. Over time, manga have been able to pivot from being artistic expressions of certain messages to including minimal symbolism like a YouTuber fitting sponsored checkboxes to message that, if actually taken to heart, would really counteract the original ways of the industry's earlier works. And Tsukuna as a character exists half as an embodiment of this and as a main villain, and half as a cautionary tale. Rather than preserving through the system, or sorcery civilization, and overcoming hostilic setbacks like Yuji, Sukuna is only an extreme of the first step, insisting on fighting his circumstances to his last breath instead, refusing to take a loss until then, even when it makes him a villain in his own way. And it's counterproductive overall. Sukuna is basically the ultimate form of an anti-establishment character taking revenge against a lingering system with institutionalized hostility towards him, and armed with the power to literally dismantle things. But the story makes a point of how things tend to exist for reasons, even if they're not ultimate causes then as symptoms of averaging wider problems that are harder to see. So just removing a thing you see as embodying a problem just undoes a balance and merely redirects misfortune like through some equivalent exchange, as you're not holistically progressing or resolving anything. It's not out to make Sukuna a bad guy though, it's just showing how his mind step is a stepping stone, how he's only made a cautionary tale when he insists on staying with it and doubles down. And that's why when he does lose, he's chill and mature about the whole thing, and the start of the story specifically paints him as a big villain only for the following subtext throughout the story to gradually show him being more mature and insightful than a comical villain with his dialogue and reported history would be. And the parties introducing him that way at the start of the story are behind a lot of the tragedies and misdoings, including many of Sukuna's. Jujutsu Kaisen is a story that punishes you for letting it paint a narrative for you, since any media can be written to influence your behavior. And if you don't meaningfully unpack and take away messages, then you're just going to contribute to ongoing problems. <laughs> Sorry, something stuck in my throat again. And it only gives you a happy ending if you're looking at the parties and circumstances more objectively. Sukuna's character serves as the embodiment of resistance against institutional problems, 
quite literally dismantling it. His story challenges its audience to see beyond surface level narratives and avoid oversimplifying messages with a mere tragic backstory and trusting its audience to think critically. But sadly, you can't always predict the future. Look, I'm not trying to say that every person that watches TikTok is illiterate. Shit, I death scroll on that app at least one hour a day. But I will admit the mob mentality, especially around this series, can get quite annoying. Again, is everyone that watches TikTok stupid? No. Am I salty about the like-dislike ratio on this video I made a couple weeks back? Maybe, but the point is, Sukuna, both as a character and what he provided throughout the series, especially the ending, should not be taken for granted, but instead cherished for what it was. Dismantling of what is considered commonplace, both in the series and in the industry as a whole. But anyways guys, that's the end of the video. As per usual, I'll leave some clips of some audio. Enjoy. Burger POV is crazy. I don't know what you're talking about. Alright, you guys ready? Are you guys fucking ready? Don't look under my skirt, you perverts. Okay. Here you go. <laughs> All right. Hello, my burger. How are you doing? <sighs> Good morning, my dark passenger. Did you sleep well? Give me one quick second. So, tonight's the night, and it's going to happen again and again. Another day in Miami, another great time for senseless murder. Come on, let's go. Everyone was against me. You knew this as well. You knew this going in. That's why you were so fucking confident, weren't you? Well, you motherfucker. Look, look, in all honesty, the most important single fact about me, I'm not alone. And Harry kept it from me. <laughs> what do I imagine? That's <laughs> <laughs> enough of you. That's enough. The law isn't enough.